Section 8. A Convert to Conscription of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Have maintained and consolidated our position in the captured trench. Extract from Official Dispatch. Number 9 to Walk 36, Sapper Duffy, J., a section southland company royal engineers had been before the war plain jim duffy laborer and as such had been an ardent anti-militarist anti-conscriptionist and anti-everything else his labor leaders and agitators told him his anti-militarist beliefs were sunk soon after the beginning of the war and there is almost a complete story in itself in the tale of their sinking weighted first by a girl who looked ahead no further than the pleasure of walking out with a khaki uniform and finally plunged into the deeps of the army by the jibe of a stauncher anti-militarist during a heated argument that if he believed now in fighting why didn't he go and fight himself but even after his enlistment he remained true to his beliefs in voluntary service and the account of his conversion to the principles of conscription, no half-and-half -half measures of military training or rifle clubs or hybrid arrangements of that sort, but out-and-out -out conscription, may be more interesting, as it certainly is more typical, of the conversion of more thousands of members of the serving forces than will ever be known until those same thousands return to their civilian lives and the holding of their civilian votes. By nightfall, the captured trench, well, it was only a courtesy title to call it a trench, previous to the assault, the British guns had knocked it about a good deal. Bombs and grenades had helped further to disrupt it in the attacks and counter-attacks during the day, and finally, after it was captured and held, the enemy had shelled and high explosive it uh, out of any likeness to a real trench. But the infantry had clung throughout the day to the ruins, had beaten off several strong counter-attacks, and in the intervals had done what they could to dig themselves more securely in and repile some heaps of sandbags from the shattered parapet on the trench's new front. The casualties had been heavy and since there was no passage from the front British trench to the captured portion of the German, except across the open of the neutral ground, most of the wounded and all the killed had had to remain under such cover as could be found in the wrecked trench. The position of the unwounded was bad enough and unpleasant enough, but it was a great deal worse for the wounded. A bad wound damages mentally as well as physically. The casualty is out of the fight, has had a first field dressing placed on his wound, has been set on one side to be removed at the first opportunity to the dressing station and the rear. He can do nothing more to protect himself or take such cover as offers. He is in the hands of the stretcher-bearers, and must submit to be moved when and where they think fit and in this case the casualties did not even have the satisfaction of knowing that every minute that passed meant a minute further from the danger zone, a minute nearer to safety and to the doctors, and the hospital's hope of healing. Here they had to be throughout the long day, hearing the shriek of each approaching shell, waiting for the crash of its fall, wondering each time if this one, the, the rush of its approach rising louder and louder to an appalling screech, was going to be the finish. A direct hit. Many of the wounded were wounded again, or killed as they lay, and from others the strength and the life had drained slowly out before nightfall. But now that darkness had come, the casualties moved out and the supports moved in. From what had been the German second trench, and on this portion of front was now their forward one, Lights were continually going up, and bursts of rifle and machine-gun fire were coming, and an occasional shell still whooped up and burst over or behind the captured trench. This meant that the men, the supports, and food and water carriers and stretcher-bearers were under a dangerous fire even at night in crossing the old neutral ground, 
and it meant that one of the first jobs absolutely necessary to the holding of the captured trench was the making of a connecting path more or less safe for moving men, ammunition, and food by night or day. This, then, was the position of affairs when A section of the Southland Company of Engineers came up to take a hand, and this communication trench was the task that Sapper Duffy, J, found himself set to work on. Personally, Sapper Duffy knew nothing of and cared less for the tactical situation. All he knew or cared about was that he had done a longish march up from the rear the night before, that he had put in a hard day's work carrying up bales of sandbags and rolls of barbed wire from the carts to the trenches, and that here before him was another night's hard labor, to say nothing of the prospect of being drilled by a rifle bullet or mangled by a shell. All the information given him and his section by their section officer was that they were to dig a communication trench, that it must be completed before morning, that as long as they were above ground they would probably be under a nasty fire, and that therefore the sooner they dug themselves down under cover, the better it would be for the job and for all concerned. A section removed its equipment and tunics and moved out on to the neutral ground in its shirt sleeves, shivering at first in the raw cold and at the touch of the drizzling rain, but knowing that the work would very soon warm them beyond need of hampering clothes. In the ordinary sense, digging a trench under fire is done more or less under cover by sapping. Digging the first part in a covered spot, standing in the deep hole, cutting down the face, and gradually burrowing away across the danger zone. The advantage of this method is that the workers keep digging their way forward, while all the time they are below ground and in the safety of the sap they dig. The disadvantage is that the narrow trench only allows one or two men to get at its end or face to dig, and the work consequently takes time. Here it was urgent that the work be completed that night, because it was very certain that as soon as its whereabouts were disclosed by daylight, it would be subjected to a fire too severe to allow any party to work, even if the necessary passage of men to and fro would uh, leave any room for a working party. The digging, therefore, had to be done down from the surface, and the diggers, until they had sunk themselves into safety, had to stand and work fully exposed to the bullets that whined and hissed across from the enemy trenches. A zigzag line had been laid down to mark the track of the trench, and Sapper Duffy was placed by his sergeant on this line and told briefly to get on with it. Sapper Duffy spat on his hands, placed his spade on the exact spot indicated, drove it down, and began to dig at a rate that was apparently leisurely, but actually was methodical and nicely calculated to a speed that could be long and unbrokenly sustained. During the first minute, many bullets whistled and sang past, and Sapper Duffy took no notice. A couple went, What? past his ear, and he swore and slightly increased his working speed. When a bullet whistles or sings past, it is a comfortable distance clear. When it goes hiss or swish, it is too close for safety, and when it says what very sharply and viciously, it is merely a matter of being a few inches out either way. Sapper Duffy had learned all this by full experience, and now the number of whats he heard gave him a very clear understanding of the dangers of this particular job. He was the farthest out man of the line. On his left hand he could just distinguish the dim figure of another digger, stooping and straightening, stooping and straightening, with the rhythm and regularity of a machine. On his right hand was empty darkness, lit up every now and then by the glow of a flare light showing indistinctly through the drizzling rain. Out of the darkness, or looming big against the misty light, figures came and went, stumbling and slipping in the mud, stretcher-bearers carrying or supporting the wounded, a ration supply party staggering under boxes balanced on shoulders, a strung-out line of supports stooped and trying to move quietly, men in double files linked together by swinging ammunition boxes. All these things Sapper Duffy saw out of the tail of his eye, and without stopping or slacking the pace of his digging. He fell unconsciously to timing his movements to those of the other man, and for a time the machine became a twin-engine working beat for beat, 
thrust, stoop, straighten, heave, thrust, stoop, straighten, heave. Then a bullet said the indescribable word that means hit, and Duffy found that the other half of the machine had stopped suddenly and collapsed in a little heap. Somewhere along the line a voice called softly, Stretcher bearers! And almost on the word two men and a stretcher materialized out of the darkness, and a third was stooping over the broken machine. He's gone, said the third man after a pause. Lift him clear. The two men dropped the stretcher, stooped and fumbled, lifted the limp figure, laid it down a few yards away from the line, and vanished in the direction of another call. Sapper Duffy was alone with his spade in a foot-deep square hole, and the hissing bullets. The thoughts of the dead man so close beside him disturbed him vaguely, although he had never given a thought to the scores of dead he had seen behind the trench, and that he knew were scattered thick over the neutral ground where they had fallen in the first charge. But this man had been one of his own company in his own section. It was different about him, somehow. Yet, of course, Sapper Duffy knew that the dead must at times lie where they fall, because the living must always come before the dead, especially when there are many more wounded than there are stretchers or stretcher-bearers. But all the same, he didn't like poor old Jigger Adams being left there. Didn't see how he could go home and face old Jigger's missus and tell her he'd come away and left Jigger lying in the mud of a mangle wurzel field. Blessed if he wouldn't have a try when they were going to give Jigger a lift back. A line of men, shirt sleeved like himself and carrying spades in their hands, moved out past him. An officer led them, and another, with Sapper Duffy's section officer, brought up the rear and passed along the word to halt when he reached Duffy. "'Here's the outside man of my lot,' he said, "'so you'll join on beyond them. You've just come in, I hear, so I suppose your men are fresh.' "'Fresh,' said the other disgustedly. "'Not much.' They've been digging trenches all day about four miles back. It's too sickening. Pity we don't do like the Boches. Conscript all the able-bodied civilians and make them do this trench digging in rear. Then we might be fresh for the firing line. Don't so must talk about conscripting them, said Duffy's officer reprovingly. One volunteer, you know, worth ten pressed men. Yes, said the other. But when there isn't enough of the one volunteer, it's about time to call her the ten pressed. Two or three flares went up almost simultaneously from the enemy's line. The cackle of fire rose to a brisk fusillade, and through it ran the sharp rat-a-tat-tat of a machine-gun. The rising sound of the reports told plainly of the swinging muzzle, and officers and men dropped flat in the mud and waited till the sweeping bullets had passed over their heads. Men may work on and chance it against rifle fire alone, but the sweep of a machine gun is beyond chance, and very near to the certainty of sudden death to all in the circle of its swing. The officers passed on, and the new men began to dig. Sapper Duffy also resumed work, and as he did so he noticed that there was something familiar about the bulky shape of the new digger next to him. "'Or what are you?' asked the new man heaving out the first spadeful rapidly and dexterously. "'We're A section, Southland Company,' said Duffy. "'And I, I say, ain't you beefy, Wilson?' "'That's me,' said the other without checking his spade. "'And blow me, you must be Duffy, Jim Duffy.' "'That's right,' said Duffy. "'But I didn't know you'd join, Beefy.' "'Oh, just a week or two after you,' said Beefy. "'Did you know?' Boss's two sons had got commissions, joined the sappers, and tried to raise a company out of the works to join. <laughs> Couldn't, though. I was the only one. Look out, is that blanky Maxim again, said Duffy, and they dropped flat very hurriedly. There was no more conversation at the moment. There were too many bullets about to encourage any lingering there, and both men wanted all their breath for their work. It was hard work, too. Duffy's back and shoulder and arm muscles began to ache dully, but he stuck doggedly to it. He even made an attempt to speed up Beefy's rate of shoveling, though he knew by old experience alongside Beefy that he could never keep up with him, the unchallenged champion of the old gang. 
Whether it was that the lifting rain had made them more visible or that the sound of their digging had been heard, they never knew. But the rifle fire, for some reason, became faster and closer, and again and again the call passed for stretcher-bearers, and a constant stream of wounded began to trickle back from the trench-diggers. Duffy's section was not so badly off now because they had sunk themselves hip-deep, and the earth they threw out in a parapet gave extra protection. But it was harder work for them now because they stood in soft mud and water well above the ankles. The new company, being the more exposed, suffered more from the fire. But each man of them had a smaller portion of trench to dig, so they were catching up to the first workers. But all spaded furiously and in haste to be done with the job, while the officers and sergeants moved up and down the line and watched the progress made. More cold-bloodedly unpleasant work it would be hard to imagine. The men had none of the thrill and heat of combat to help them, they had not the hope that a man has in a charge across the opening, that a minute or two gets the worst of it over. They had not even the chance the fighting man has, where at last his hand may save his head. Their business was to stand in the one spot, open and unprotected, and without hope of cover or protection for a good hour or more on end. They must pay no heed to the singing bullets, to the crash of a bursting shell, to the rising and falling glow of the flares. Simply they must give body and mind to the job in hand, and dig and dig and keep on digging. There had been many brave deeds done by the fighting men on that day. There had been bold leading and bold following in the first rush across the open against a tornado of fire. There had been forlorn hope dashes for ammunition or to pick up wounded. There had been dogged and desperate courage in clinging all day to the battered trench under an earth-shaking tempest of high-explosive shells, bombs, and bullets. But it is doubtful if the day or the night had seen more nerve-trying, courage-testing work more deliberate and long-drawn bravery than was shown, as a matter of course and as a part of the job, in the digging of that communication trench. It was done at last, and although it might not be a Class One exhibition bit of work, it was, as Beefy Wilson remarked, a deal better than none. And although the trench was already a foot deep in water, Beefy stated no more than the bold truth in saying, Come tomorrow, there's plenty will put up glad with their knees being below high water mark for the sake of having their heads below low bullet mark. But if the trench was finished, the night's work for the engineers was not. They were moved up into the captured trench and told that they had to repair it and wire out in front of it before they were done. They had half an hour's rest before recommencing work, and Beefy Wilson and Jim Duffy hugged the shelter of some tumbled sandbags, lit their pipes and turned the bowls down, and exchanged reminiscences. "'Let's see,' said Beefy. "'Isn't Jigger Adams in your lot?' "'Was,' corrected Jim. "'Tell an hour ago. He's out yon with a bullet in him. Stiff by now.' Beefy breathed blasphemous regrets. Rough on his missus and the kids. Six of them, weren't it? Ah, assented Jim, but she'll get something for the society funds. Not a ape worth, said Beefy. You remember? No, it was just after you left. The trades unions decided no benefits would be paid out to them as listed. It was Ben Shrillett engineered that. He was secretary and treasurer and things of other societies as well as ours. He fought the war right along, and he's still fighting it. He's a anti-militant, he says. Uh, anti-militarist, Jim corrected. He had taken some pains himself in the old days to get the word itself and some of its meaning right. Anti-militarist, then, said Beefy. Anyhow, he stuck out again all sorts of soldiering. This stopping the society benefits was a trump card, too. I blocked a, a whole crowd from listing that I knew who myself would have joined. Queered the boss's sons raising that company, too. They had frickers and the BSL company had the works to draw from. Could have raised a couple hundred easy if Ben Shrillett hadn't got at them. Oh, you know how he talks the fellers round. 
"'I know,' agreed Jem, sucking hard on his pipe. The sergeant broke in on their talk. "'Now then,' he said briskly, "'sooner we start, sooner we're done, and off home to our downy couch. Here, Duffy!' And he pointed out the work Duffy was to start. For a good two hours the engineers laboured like slaves again. The trench was so badly wrecked that it practically had to be reconstructed. It was dangerous work because it meant moving freely up and down, both where cover was and was not. It was physically heavy work because spade work in wet ground must always be that, and when the spade constantly encounters a debris of broken beams, sandbags, rifles, and other impediments, and the work has to be performed in eye-confusing alternations of black darkness and dazzling flares, it makes the whole thing doubly hard. When you add in the constant whisk of passing bullets and the smack of their striking, the shriek and shattering burst of high-explosive shells and the drone and whir of flying splinters, you get labor conditions removed to the utmost limit from ideal, and to any but the men of the sappers well over the edge of the impossible. The work at any other time would have been gruesome and unnerving, because the gasping and groaning of the wounded hardly ceased from end to end of the captured trench, and in digging out the collapsed sections many dead Germans and some British were found blocking the vigorous thrust of the spades. Duffy was getting fair fed up, although he still worked on mechanically. He wondered vaguely what uh, Ben Shrillett uh, would have said to any member of the trade union that had worked a night, a day, and a night on end. He wondered, too, how Ben Shrillett would have shaped in the Royal Engineers, and for all his cracking muscles and the back-breaking weight and unwieldiness of the wet sandbags, he had to grin at the thought of Ben, with his podgy fat fingers and his visible rotundity of waistcoat, sweating and straining there in the wetness and darkness with death whistling past his ear and crashing in shrapnel bursts about him. The joke was too good to keep to himself and he passed it to Beefy next time he came near. Beefy saw the jest clearly and guffawed aloud, to the amazement of a clay-daubed infantryman, who had had nothing in his mind but thoughts of death and loading and firing his rifle for hours past. "'No wonder Ben's again conscription,' said Beefy. "'They might conscription him!' and passed on grinning. Duffy had never looked at it in that light. He'd been anti-conscription himself, though now, maybe, he didn't know, he wasn't so sure. And after the trench was more or less repaired came the last and the most desperate business of all, the wiring out there in the open under the eye of the soaring lights. In ones and twos, during the intervals of darkness, the men tumbled over the parapet, dragging stakes and coils of wire behind them. They managed to drive short stakes and run trip-wires between them without the enemy suspecting them. When a light flamed, every man dropped flat in the mud and lay still as the dead beside them till the light died. In the brief intervals of darkness they drove the stakes with muffled hammers and ran the lengths of barbed wire between them. Heart in mouth they worked, one eye on the dimly seen hammer and stake-head, the other on the German trench, watching for the first upward trailing sparks of the flare. Plenty of men were hit, of course, because, light or dark, the bullets were kept flying. But there was no pause in the work, not even to help the wounded in. If they were able to crawl, they crawled, dropping flat and still while the lights burned, hitching themselves painfully toward the parapet under cover of the darkness. If they could not crawl, they lay still, dragging themselves perhaps behind the cover of a dead body or lying quiet in the open till the time would come when helpers would seek them. Their turn came when the low wires were complete. The wounded were brought in cautiously to the trench then, and hoisted over the parapet. The working party was carefully detailed, and each man's duty marked out before they crawled again into the open with long stakes and strands of barbed wire. The party lay there a minute after minute through periods of light and darkness until the officer in charge thought a favourable chance had come and gave the arranged signal. Every man leaped to his feet. The stakes were planted, and quick blow after blow drove them home. Another light soared up and flared out, and every man dropped and held his breath, waiting for the crash of fire that would tell they were discovered. But the flare died out without a sign, and the working party hurriedly renewed their task. 
This time the darkness held for an unusual length of time, and the stakes were planted, the wires fastened, and cross pieces of wood with interlacings of barbed wire already were rolled out and pegged down without another light showing. The word passed down, and the men scrambled back into safety. "'Better shoot a light up quick,' said the engineer officer to the infantry commander. "'They have a working party out now. I heard them hammering. That's why they went so long without a light.' A pistol light was fired, and the two stared out into the open ground on it. "'Thought so,' said the engineer, pointing. "'New stakes, see? And those fellows lying beside them.' "'Get your tools together, Sergeant,' he said, as several more lights flamed and a burst of rapid fire rose from the British rifles. "'And collect your party. Our job's done, and I'm not sorry for it.' It was just breaking daylight when the remains of the engineer's party emerged from the communication trench, and already the guns on both sides were beginning to talk. Beefy Wilson and Jim Duffy, between them, found Jigger's body and brought it in as far as the dressing station. Behind the trenches, Beefy's company and Jim's section took different roads, and the two old friends parted with a casual so long and see you again sometime. Duffy had two hours' sleep, in a sopping wet roofless house about three miles behind the firing line. Then the section was roused and marched back to their billets in a shell-wrecked village a good ten miles farther back. They found what was left of the other three sections of the Southland Company there, heard the tale of how the company had been cut up in advancing with the charging infantry, ate a meal, scraped some of the mud off themselves, and sought their blankets and wet straw beds. Jim Duffy could not get the thought of Ben Shrillett, labor leader and agitator, out of his mind, and mixed with his thoughts as he went to sleep were that officer's remarks about pressed men that perhaps accounts for his waking thoughts running on the same groove when his sergeant roused him at black midnight and informed him the section was being turned out to dig trenches. Trenches, sputtered Sapper Duffy, us. "'How is it our turn again?' "'Because, my son,' said the sergeant, "'there's nobody else about here to take a turn. "'Come on, roll out, shower leg!' "'It was then that Sapper Duffy was finally converted "'and renounced for ever and ever his anti-conscription principles. "'Nobody else,' he said slowly. "'And England fair stiff with men.' The sooner we get conscription, the better I'll like it. Conscription, solid for every blooming able-bodied man and boy. And I hope Ben Shrillett and his likes is the first to be took. Conscription, he said with the emphasis of finality as he fumbled in wet straw for a wetter boot. Out and uh, out, lock, stock and barrel, conscription. That same night, Ben Shrillett was presiding at a meeting of the strike committee. He had read on the way to the meeting the communique that told briefly of Sapper Duffy and his fellow engineers' work of the night before, and the descriptive phrase struck him as sounding neat and defective. He worked it now into his speech to the committee, explaining how and where they and he benefited by this strike, unpopular as it had proved. We've vindicated the right of the workers, he said. We've shown that war or no war, labor means to be more than mere wage slaves. War can't last forever, and we here, this committee, proved ourselves by this strike the true leaders and the champions of labor, the guardians of the rights of trade unionism. We, gentlemen, have always been that, and by the strike, and he concluded with the phrase from the dispatch, we have maintained and consolidated our position. The committee said, hear, hear. It is a pity they could not have heard what Sapper Duffy was saying as he sat up in his dirty wet straw listening to the rustle and patter of rain on the barn's leaky roof and tugging on an icy cold board-stiff boot. End of section 8